Greetings, everyone. It is the 8th of October, and this is the People-Centered Internet uh, Community Call. Delighted to have you with us. I'm Kevin Clark. Uh, we have our um, uh, committee members with us. Ben Kaczynski is here and uh, uh, lurking, all right, but in a very positive way, Casey uh, Kamlowski, you know, opens up and uh, makes sure that we're technically uh, working every time we uh, do one of these calls. So we thank her for her uh, service to the, the community. I'm sure that you brought some topics, which is great, um, but I'm gonna open us up to, uh, or sh shall I say, open us up with uh, the notion that next year we will be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the internet. And of course, one of our co-founders, Mitt Cerf, is uh, you know play a pivotal role uh, in the uh, making it real as first ARPANET uh, that grew into uh, the internet. I want to share something with you that I'm going to ask you to help with. Right? Um, there there are two asks. First ask is that um, our our new board uh, chair uh, Yasha Stein is seeking uh, enterprise and NGO participation in the 50th anniversary at a variety of sponsorship levels. So if you're listening today or you're listening to the recording or know a someone who knows an organization that is uh, its business model or the organization you know, benefits greatly from the existence of the internet, then we should give them exposure to the activities and the festivities for next year and see if they want to play with us. So I'll just put that out there. I also want to show you uh, something that's in development right now, uh, which is a timeline for uh, people-centered internet with, uh, you know, going all the way back to, you know, the beginning. I'm trying to make this move. Let me just see why. Okay, there it goes. All right. So we go all the way back to the beginning. It's like a tree, right, where here's the root. Here's the birth of the internet. And then on the left-hand side are things that are happening in terms of people. You know, what did it initially enable? It initially enabled governments, the U.S. government and universities to connect with each other. Uh, then, you know, TCPIP comes along a little bit later. What am I asking for? I am asking for you to tell us what we should put on the timeline. What are the things that you think would be pivotal moments where people were unable to do something they couldn't do before or when the technology you know, advanced in a, in a particularly interesting or momentous way? If you have contributions, I'm designing this with Jim Qualick, the design director for Content Evolution, which is my primary company. You usually see choice flows, but, you know, content evolution is the backbone to a lot of things that, that, that I do. So I'm working with Jim, you know, to make this real. And what, here's what I want. Send it to Kevin at peoplecentered.net, which is my people-centered internet address. Tell us what the date is and the particular moment and a link, right? That helps you know, reference it from some trustworthy re reference source because this is going to be interactive. You're going to be able to go to that moment and then click on it and it'll take you to the place where the backup information. So if you want to learn more, that you can. So that's the ask. Um, and if you can help us with it, that would be great. We're looking forward to making this uh, real. Any questions before we go to your topics today? Yeah, could you just scroll down that one? Sure, glad it's, to. Yeah. Going all the way down to the bottom, here is the root ARPANET. Okay. Actually, would it be possible to share this? In what way? 
just to have this slide sent to us, emailed to us, so we can go through it, and then if we have contributions. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, I, I can. It's it's a draft, so I can certainly send you the draft PDF, Thank and then you. you can, you know, it isn't, it isn't designed to perfectly print out on a piece of paper. All right, um, you know, it's it it is a web centric object, but you, I, I can certainly send it to you. All right. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, we look forward to your uh, to your contributions, and I'll ask uh, uh, you to do that after we finish our call today. So this is an open mic. I see May Lynn with us. Hi, May Lynn. Glad to have you with us. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Oh, you, in my you, garden, and you look, uh, I'm you're in a rural setting. Listen. Here to listen to what all of you have to say. So I'm looking forward to it. That, that's a new environment, uh, Maylin. Uh, is, is this your gardening? You, you're saying your gardening center where you live? It it is um <laughs> it is my garden pavilion where I work. Oh, and it has uh it has tea <laughs> teapots. Oh and great! It's a sort of tea garden moon viewing pavilion. It's not uh but it is where I work and I have a standing desk here. Oh, that's great. That's great. I, thank you for sharing uh, an insight about you know, your, your work environment. All right, so the mics are open for your topics. Who has a, uh, who brought a topic for us that you're uh, interested in getting us started today? Uh, before we move on, I wonder yes, if you're going to have another slide on uh, projecting to future because you have one reflecting in the past and there are uh, technologies that are emerging. So do you think it will be interesting to have another slide in projecting to future or allowing these three go forward and looking at the future? Absolutely. And in fact, you're, uh, you know, you're thinking the same way that Jim and I were thinking is, you know, perhaps you know, since that's a little bit fanciful is, is again, perhaps that should be logarithmic, right? Um, because we have lots of actual dates, right? So that should progress, you know, very linearly, but perhaps, uh, you know, from now to, or next year to a hundred years from now, perhaps uh, some of those observations, you know, should, uh, you know, be more of the logarithmic temporal distortion. <laughs> But we're I absolutely would welcome thoughts in that arena too, Hari. Thank you. You bet. Okay. Does anyone have a uh, topic they want to share? Hello, David. You are raising your hand. Hi there. Looking How's forward. What's, your, what's your idea? What's your What do you want to talk about? Well, okay. I wanted to ask a question about your graph first of all. Okay, uh, sure. Does it have well, to start at ARPANET? Discussion. Could it? Could it? Does it have to start at ARPANET, or can it go before that? Okay, I mean, like as I, we may think, I would probably start to have that look like roots. Okay, you know, other derivative inputs. So, uh, sure, why not? Okay. Okay, awesome. And I wanted to just let everyone know that tomorrow my book is being published by Taylor and Francis. It's called The Meta Web, The Next Level of the Internet. And it's got a feature uh, that was written by May Lin about PCI in it. Vint um, reviewed it. And there's, yeah, there are a number of quotes from him as well in there as well. So uh, I'm I'm really excited about the book and I'm expecting it to be a slow build, but at, at some point I'm looking forward to sharing with you all a bit more about it. Okay. Did you put a uh, link where we can find that book in the chat? If you didn't put it in there. Okay. I will. Okay. I'm, I'm looking at chat right now. Uh, Doug, Doug is always a prolific poster. <laughs> Right in in chat, and I see um, Jim Spore. Okay, so he's putting in some stuff. Okay, so I'll I'll <laughs> I'll capture the chat for sure and uh, share this with Jim. That's great. MetaWeb book. All right, so you've got your own website. Good for you. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, essentially, the the book is is uh, positing that having a layer, a meta layer on top of the web, will allow us to solve a lot of the accountability problems that we're having now on the web, as well as open up the possibility of deep collaboration that's not currently possible. Wonderful. Glad to hear that. I'm looking at. Yeah. How many forms is it available in? Is, is it print? Uh, is it is it going to be available on a Kindle? Yeah, it's hardcover, softcover, and Kindle. I'm also looking to do a NFT version as well. It's going to be the first book that Taylor and Francis has agreed to allow to be an NFT. So right. uh, I'm I'm getting that together shortly. Audiobook in your own voice. You know that that's a great idea. <laughs> I need to put that on the list. Yeah, put it that. on the list for sure. <laughs> it sounds like a lot of work, but I think it would be fun. No, they're they're podcasting studios in large cities all over the place, right? And they would be glad to help you commit it to you know. So they're they're places to get that done. No problem. Awesome. <laughs> that's a great idea. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Um, so the people who are uh, posting in in chat, Doug, anything? Yeah, and I'll send you an email on this uh, this topic uh, too. Um, you know, the first internet connection was in Stanford and UC um, LA, I, I believe, and uh, um, and it, coming up on the fifty fourth anniversary of of the at first connection. Of course, TCP/IP um, revolutionized the the internet. Of course, um, it made it practical. Um, but, uh, you know, I have the running theme of when did we reach a billion of something, right? So there's the introduction of something and then, you know, things get interesting when you have a billion people using it. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of my running theme, um, uh, on this topic. All right. So, yeah, uh, th that's a book in and of itself, you know, Doug's book of billions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, when, when the billions in the past and with the billions in the future. Sure, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, what what were the pivotal moments before, you know, a billion wasn't possible because we didn't have that many people. All right. So what was the equivalent of a billion, you know, a thousand years ago? Yeah, well, in 1802 is when we had a billion humans on the planet. Okay. So it's a fun fact. In fact, that's how I got that I got to started this blog, this running blog, because it's like, well, I knew in 2002 there were billions um, cell phones on the planet, and right. it's like, oh, 200 years difference delta, and then I then I started thinking about a billion. So like like right now, it's like I'm working on artificial intelligence and, and generative AI. It's like, when will a billion people be working on AI using AI? Um, you know, and you can make the argument that everyone's doing you know predictive text is using AI. Uh, you know, but uh, I, you know, I, my definition is saving at least a half hour a day and a hundred million people paying for it in some way. I was just judging uh, new business plans, you know, with entrepreneurs over at the University of North Carolina yesterday. And far too many of the plans, you know, had built in, you know, some kind of generative AI, all right, into the thing. And I said, so, Right? Are, are you sure that you've got the right cost assumptions in here? Right? And you know, can you can you actually own this, or is or would somebody, if you committed to a platform, could they dinner disintermediate you? Right? At, at yeah. some point, or change you know this, so you'd have to pivot. Right? So we had some fairly rigorous conversations about the business model assumptions about using the current stuff. I, I said. A lot of venture capital funding, right? The current stuff, it'll it'll get more costly later. All right. Yeah. So, other thoughts. Uh, I see some posts from Jim. Jim, are you there? Yeah, I'll put down the cat string for a moment. <laughs> Um, yeah, I did just, uh, play with Anthropic and I just thought maybe I would mention that I'm, um, usually I have like four tabs open. I have, uh, 
uh, OpenAI's ChatGPT. I have Google Bard. I have Claude Anthropic, which I like a lot. And um, I have uh, uh, Bing. The new Bing, by the way, is fantastic. The one that came out a week ago. The art generation capability, I think, is mid-journey level. Um, yeah, and Dolly 3. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. And I type my prompt into all four uh, so I can, and I try to keep my prompts, uh, the responses short, like a paragraph at most, because I can quickly uh, compare across the four tabs because verification is the big problem, right? You don't know if what it's generating is accurate, but usually if all four kind of have it the same mm -hmm. uh, or where they're different, you can go in and verify. I find that's an interesting tip. And I'm um, mentoring about 60 students right now at different universities around the world on how to use generative AI. And that's one of the tips that they've all said uh, is, is really helping them with the verification task. Um, they're, they're saying generative AI is improving their productivity on certain things like writing essays, generating pictures, even videos. The video generation stuff is getting very good, but the verification stuff is harder. But by having multiple tools and short chunks at a time, they're really uh, they're really finding they can do the verification stuff quickly. And that's the hundred trillion dollar question that no company has solved is how to separate fact from fiction. But that's hard for people too, it seems. <laughs> yeah, that's true, hundred percent. So that's uh, my that's my update and thoughts for today. Uh, <laughs> and doing something you know similar and uh, they all increasingly do something better than the other one but it goes week by week it, it's moving at that pace right so yeah um, i i find that asking it to imitate a style of someone someone you know whoever your hero is for designing something or writing something oh please you know write this in the style of you know the you know lead practice person at McKinsey, right, in charge of global water systems, right? It does much better if you if you specifically ask it to imitate a person, right, that it has access to in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, I was talking to, out in the real world. Yeah, Doug? Yeah, I was talking to a college student yesterday, and uh, he's interested, he's a, a math major, and so he's going to go to this uh, competition he, uh, where they, they give, you know, ideas, you know, and this is at the college, you know, at the non-graduate level, you know, just the undergraduate. And, uh, and so I said, well, what you can do is you can take the winners of last year and put them into chat GPT and then say, OK, given this is the winner's topics, give me a list of 10 novel ideas of new topics to create. And then you can once then you get that list of ten or twenty things, mm -hmm. and then you can say, okay, given that, give me you know uh, t t pick one or kind of uh, uh, make modifications, right? Because you need to be in control of your tool. And then what you do is you say, okay, give me an outline of how you would solve this problem. And maybe what you do is you take the uh, the winner topic from last year and say, okay, give me an outline how they solved the problem, right? And in that stop, you know, understanding because you know, one big thing about prompts is is the, if you give examples of good things, you get results of good things, right? So mm -hmm. then you can say, okay, in you know, given this is the outline of uh, you know one that made the top prize, give me an outline of how you would solve this you know this new novel problem. And then, you know, then see if it can help you solve that problem very quickly. In fact, what I suggested for him to say is, is his competition would be is how you could use chat GPT or, you know, or Bard or being, I actually, I, I like Claude actually right now. I'm, I'm enjoying Claude, but using a large language model to help you solve, uh, you know, a tool. So something that would take 80 hours to do, you could do in two hours, right? In fact, I even suggested, well, reach out to the, the students who won and find out how many hours did it take them to create that, you know, to do that winning project. And my guess it would be like 100 hours um, mm -hmm. to do that project and then say, okay, can you do the same thing in five hours, you know, using the, uh, you know, a, this AI tool, right? So you, you not only solve a problem, but you show the methodology of how you solved it. 
and spent, you know, 10, 5% of the time solving it. Yeah, 100%. The, our chief generative officer, Kyle Shannon, um, recently used HeyGen. I think it's labs.heygen.com is, is the URL. You can go to it. And he did a little thing about his company and then put it into the HeyGen filter. And he did a remarkable job of generating a him speaking in Mandarin. And what it did is it also re-rendered in the video this part of his face so that his lips were syncing up with what he was saying. Um, and I said, this is, he gave it to someone who is a native speaker. And they said, oh, he's, he's really quite good. <laughs> Um, so it's a very interesting tools, right? Beginning to uh, emerge. Um, ben, you're putting stuff in chat. Join us. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just, um, I, I had mentioned that I'm putting together because they're doing some exposure for faculty and staff that haven't uh, been exposed much to GAI. And mm -hmm. I thought to do a scavenger hunt to have them prepare for it. So give them 10 or 12 tasks to do simple things that by the end of it, they will have a portfolio of experience. They mm -hmm. giving lecture, what is AI and crap like that is boring as hell, but having them do some uh, uh, 10 tasks that deal with image, voice, all kinds of things. I think it uh, uh, it'll give them a soft entry. So I'm open to, for any suggestions as to what might be in that portfolio of the scavenger hunt. All right. So one of the things that we talked about um, in another thread last week was why aren't the voice assistants right, um, that are out there more prevalent in business? You know, we have it in our homes, we have it on our phones, but you know, why, as, as Nathan Shedrock said in his book, uh, make it so, why isn't the science fiction that we see where you're talking to the computer, like in Star Trek, right? And say, you know, how many parsecs are we away from Altair 6, right? Or more practically, you know, how many units did we sell in Brazil last month? Um, why isn't that data connected to voice assistance. And generally, it looks like uh, we don't have the ability to connect the proprietary data to that kind of stuff, uh, you know, and, and render it inside safely inside the business. And there's a general distrust, right, of, you know, it's listening to us, right? It's transmitting our secrets outside of the business. What do you guys think? Technically feasible. Ben, say more. Well, we're we're doing a, some of that now, and that's that's simply uh, the synthesizing is is quite doable and quite retained privacy because your synthesization uh, happens uh, locally. I'm working on right now an LLM for our Office of Research and Ad Administration. And they were adamant, uh, CISO uh, was adamant that none of that be put on the global cesspool <laughs> that, are, <laughs> that are out there. And so I've, I've been, we've been working with private GPT and, and uh, Flowwise and others that deal with offline LLMs. Uh, but um, I actually got permission to move into into Microsoft's op Azure OpenAI, hmm. and they said the cloud was okay as long as it was enterprise protected cloud. So uh, I I just don't want to make it a zero one about completely uh, offline and and exposed to leverage uh, cloud and, and internet assets in there. But certainly for voice synthesis now, and HeyGen does a fantastic job. But as you say right now you ship it in out to process for processing and it comes back. But there's no reason that can't be uh, open source and probably GitHubbed to uh, to individuals. 
and Synthesia does pretty well on on the voice synthesis. Yeah. Think about all of the movies that can be re-rendered in a way that <clears throat> looks natural as opposed to the stuff <clears throat> that's dubbed today and it looks creepy, right? Um, so you'd be able to overcome that with this tech. Yeah, I've, I've had some friends in the movies uh, that put out things even this week about what a disaster this is and, and, and going to be about uh, rendering. I, I was telling him that he doesn't know the half of it. They keep thinking of movies as pre-production, production and post-production, and then in a can. I said that whole in a can thing is going to break. Exhibition mm -hmm. is performance. I'm going to be able to render whatever actor I want into any character while I'm watching it. And so it doesn't have to be in a can that, wow. that has the character casting. It's an in vivo generation, and all I need is a storyline, and uh, and I can uh, you can have some acting and positioning, but I can change that face, I can change the voice, on the fly. There you go. Yeah, I, I, we we are certainly going to have to um, understand intellectual property law through a different lens going forward. There's a lot of challenges coming up. All right, David, your hand is up. Our our author of the call, David, what do you, what's on your mind? I wrote an article last week that, as far as I know, was a, a pretty unique and novel take on on AI. It obviously didn't try to solve the whole thing, but it was really looking at what the ideal state of an individual's relationship with AI could be and when when I think about and reflect upon my experience using ChatGPT in the last, say, 10 months, because I, I started in early December, it, it seems to me that an AI, a personal AI, uh, that only works for me but has access to all my data could be way more valuable to me to help me make the right decisions in my life than it is to corporations. And what I'm envisioning is uh, a system where you you have a personal vault of data that all your activity data from the web, from, from your phone, from your messages, plus you have conversations with it. And it you are the only one who has access to this personal AI. Like there's no back doors, it's open source. So we know that you control it. Um, and that that has access to this personal data vault that you only have access to as well. And, and I just think that it would be so amazing to be able to, for example, have something that looks like a, a stock chart for your for your health and to have your AI reminding you about what you said you were going to do when you were working together with it to develop your perfect plan and telling, oh, you know, you, you missed your workout the other day. Look at the implications on your chart. Uh, yeah, I just I just think that it can be so much more valuable to us than we even think about. And I, I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. It may take a long time, but uh, if we can get to the the point where we control our data and are able to feed it into a personal AI. And I guess that means data sovereignty. Uh, I, I think we'll be in a really, a much better situation. Uh, the, uh, you know, in the diamond age, the young ladies illustrated primer, right? Uh, device you know, that's you know, looks like a book, but it's actually, you know, a computer, right? Um, it, it, it continues to be a really interesting metaphor for, you know, a data companion that gives you what you need when you need it, right? As opposed to being educated in a tr traditional sense, right? So, um, you know, the other side of that business model is that if you accumulate all that, is you have the potential to give to the next generation in your family a digital inheritance, right? 100%. I pass along your wisdom to the next generation. You know, some of the things may obsolete because I learned how to do this and then it became, you know, we don't do that anymore. I knew how to code in Flash, but, you know, there is no more Flash, so who cares, right? Um, but there are other things that are, you know, perennial, right, 
things that you probably would like to be able to share and you already forgot it, right? Uh, <laughs> so don't pass along just money, pass along what you learned during your lifetime, right? To others you care about. Yeah. Well, you know, just to add on to that, the the other thing that I was hypothesizing was that one's data, mm -hmm. you know, the totality of your data from your phone, from your computer, from everywhere, that that data could potentially for a lot of people be their most valuable asset. And therefore, yes, in, in fact, passing it on is a really interesting data inheritance. I love it, Kevin. <laughs> I've asked some of my legal brethren to figure out what is involved. There are some cultures that have some equivalency, all right? But at any rate, um, in the digital age, it needs its own you know, body of law and transference and technical capability. Um, who have we not heard from? Let me just see. Um, Bruce, sitting out there. What's on your mind? Well, I'm just <laughs> I'm just absorbing what people are saying. I think it's quite uh, I always find it so interesting. But, you know, I, I was re reflecting just on what David was saying. And, and to some extent, uh, it would seem that what he's describing is the creation of, of a personal coach, that you have all this personal <clears throat> data, but hmm. being able to access it in a way that gives you guidance as to the things you want to do, lets you know when uh, you're, you're kind of out of step with where you wanted to go. And, mm -hmm. and I, I just think that being able to do that, and I don't even know if it's even possible to do that, to be able to sequester your own personal data. Um, but I, I think that would be extremely valuable. Yeah. If, if every house is built in the future with its own skiff, right? Um, who knows? Um, Suzanne, oh, you're not- That's you're a not, skiff. Yeah, Maylin, go ahead. That's a skiff, I'm sorry. In every house- Self-contained, uh, um, no, that isn't right. Compartmentalized information facility, secure compartmentalized information facility. It's used uh, in government agencies, this is what they're talking about needing down at Mar-a-Lago for Mr. <laughs> Trump, right? Um, that they, he's got things that he needs to look at for this lawsuit and he needs a skiff, right, uh, at, at his home. So anyway. Uh, it, it, the, it's uh, sort of like living in a, in a copper bubble. Um, yeah, it's a Faraday cage. It's a Faraday cage. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the easiest thing to do for a Faraday cage at home is get an old microwave, cut off the electrical cord, and stick stuff inside. All right, you don't want to ever activate, you know, your electronics. Uh, so you cut the electrical cord first, right, uh, and then you can put it inside. It's a great Faraday cage, <laughs> right? So you can get one from the junkyard if you don't have an old one hanging around. Um, well, it would satisfy all the security requirements that are um, overwhelming. <laughs> we could just bubble the house, you know. Hundred percent. 100%. Mm. The, the, the ones that are, you know, human sized are actually quite expensive to build. Mm -hmm. Pari, your hand is up. Yes, I, uh, my internet is a bit volatile. So if you discuss this and I missed it, I apologize. But my key concern is ownership of this data. So, mm -hmm. okay, I accumulated this data, but where is the ownership? Yeah, interesting question. I suppose it depends on where did you choose, you know, to store it. Um, how did you choose to store it? Did you decide to use a third party? And if they are, what is the obligation, you know, that they have for for privacy? You know, I, I'm not sure that we've developed all of the right. Um, if, if it was in the hands of a third party that we've developed the law well enough, you know, for that kind of stewardship. Um, but Pari, um, does that, if, if it was possible, does it sound like it's a an, an appealing proposition that you would want someone to be able to do that for you? Uh, you mean to store the data? 
yeah, to be the, you know, like well, I'll and, and, and an example is like you have a safety deposit box perhaps at a bank, right? Where you're putting your valuable yes. thing and you have a key and the bank has a key and you can't get into it unless, you know. Mm -hmm. So do would you want some kind of an arrangement like that for data? Uh, perhaps, depending what technology they use. But my key concern is in accumulating this data, naturally I'm using all these various platforms. So they have access to this data. So that data to begin with is not just in my hand. It's already is within search I did in Google, telephone I used mm -hmm. and, you know, all different platforms. So how, how um, the totality of that data accumulated, um, yeah, if I can ensure that the technology used is kind of remain private and secure, mm. then I wouldn't mind third party. Or maybe I prefer uh, to store it on my own, you know, cloud or on my own computer. Mm -hmm. That's that's exactly what I do. Um, in fact, okay. I use different <laughs> encrypted USB keys for different accounts, right? Because I use, you know, certain computers. But I never want one client's um, information or data to accidentally move over into a different space. So I physically change the storage device and I have to, you know, they've got a um, physical encryption key, right, uh, that I have to put in the code for it to activate inside, you know, on the computer. So uh, that's just a protocol that I follow to make sure that, you know, and, and when I'm not using it, it goes into a Faraday cage. Uh, Doug, Ben, uh, David, if you have a different topic or you can help Pari with, with what she's talking about, um, I would welcome anyone uh, talking about what you think might be an interesting solution. And if David, you're off on a different topic in a moment, then we'll we'll hit it in a second you're on mute sir david oh a same topic topic yeah i was gonna say okay, go so right right now you're on these platforms and obviously they're getting all your data and it's interesting because i just went to a book signing uh alex tapscott web3 book and one of the things that really stood out to me is he said uh, uh, possession is nine tenths of the law so you know we don't even possess our data now in in my way of thinking just you know i wrote this book about an overlay i see an overlay is as the way to actually capture all your data now it doesn't mean that you're not gonna well that facebook's not gonna have access to it or google's not gonna have access to it because you are using their platform and uh, unless you're using some kind of uh vpn or something they're gonna they're gonna know it's you and um they're gonna have access to it but at least if you have some kind of overlay whether it's built into the browser or it's a browser extension you can actually capture all your web data and in my ideal scenario that goes i mean i think you would want to have choices of where to be able to store it so yes if you didn't want the responsibility of storing it uh perhaps you could uh you know, outsource that to a third party. I don't think that's the best solution, at least certainly not for me and and hopefully not for most people because I'd like to see us moving more towards a, a world where we are, it's decentralized and we're not relying on these middle middlemen people. But if we are, as long as they're not going to use the data and in fact, there's some uh, safeguards in place that prevent them from making it available to other people, then I, I wouldn't have a problem with that. But I, I, when I think about the, the ideal solution, at least for myself, it would be to, to have it uh, encrypted on some kind of, uh, of ledger that only I have the keys to, or, to, and there's some kind of social recovery on it so that if I was to lose my keys, I could get back access without <laughs> having to uh, reveal anything or, you know, anyone having to reveal anything or, uh, you know, any kind of jeopardy. Uh, so I, I, 
I think it's is really going to be crucial for us to be able to make that sw- that shift so that we actually are data sovereign and we have all our data, even if these other platforms do have access to some of it. Okay, very good. Maylin, your hand is up. Please join us. Indeed. Uh, I was trying to be in listening mode, but I couldn't help myself. <laughs> uh, so I, I should let you all know that um, regarding what David just said about this idea that um, we have some control of our data, um, the people sent it internet, the part that isn't in this community call, but has been writing policy papers, um, for the German G7, we had three proposals, three papers, um, which were published as part of the, the Think7 for Germany about the concept of digital utilities. So I'm just going to spell it out a little bit. We have water utilities, we have electrical utilities. These are governed as a as a public good. Um, and, and sometimes it's operated by a private company, but under rules for utilities. So, so we've proposed digital utilities as an alternative to capitalist surveillance or, or government surveillance uh, that you can actually have local um, local uh, uh, governance. And and two weeks ago at the UN Science Summit, we ran three days of panels about this concept called key challenges and objectives for digital cooperation, governance, and regulation. Um, we at PCI are moving forward um, quite strongly to take this position forward, not just within the UN Science Summit, but with the World Bank, with the ITU, with the UN uh, Office of South-South Cooperation, and through the entire campaign of the 50th anniversary, we are putting this concept forward of digital utilities. Now, to my surprise, when I was at the UN at the SDG Digital Day on September 17th, the um, uh, uh, the CEO of the Infocom Media Development Authority of Singapore talked about um, four digital utilities that Singapore itself is, is, is talking about. So I just want to say this concept of digital utility is in... Uh, in, in in a forming state where we've put forward a concept about how data could be sitting within a digital utility. Uh, some of the governments that are quite advanced in e-government, Estonia, Singapore, Switzerland, they're starting to realize there's a concept of digital public infrastructure, digital public goods that needs to be defined. And I, I'm sorry, this sounds like a speech, but this act goes all the way back actually to Douglas Engelbart. And I don't know if Jim remembers this, but Doug used to talk about how property rights, land property rights um, really made a big difference, but they really only emerged two or 300 years ago. I mean, it, that that's that's kind of, and, and, and he said it made such a difference that people said they could own property. And that was such a problem for the Native Americans because there was no concept that you owned property, a person could own property. It was a shared resource for Native Americans. And 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 they really got into a lot of trouble, as you know, the Trail of Tears and all of that, because they tried to ignore it. And so we're really in this moment where we're, we're starting to look at digital assets digital asset rights management. And, and, and this is so different from land property. We have title, land title property, you know, title companies, title registries for land. We actually are going to move into a place of title registries for digital, but digital is different from land in this particular way. Knowledge is the one thing that when you divide it, it multiplies. And, and we are not currently incented to treat it in that way. And therefore, we, we are kind of imposing um, analog world rules about property onto digital stuff, which is a very different kind of asset. So we are looking at how animation companies track their digital assets because they literally have to track millions of assets, for example, raising an eyebrow, 
you might use that over and over again. And that's an asset in an, uh, making an animation movie. So looking at those ways of managing digital rights could be useful as we're starting to talk about digital utilities. And then finally, India has made the, the, the really basically, you know, when you try and give digital identity to a billion people, you're going to learn some stuff. So they've put forward something called the Data Empowerment Protection Architecture, DEPA, as fine-grained access control about how data can be used, for what purpose, over what time, by whom. And, and that already exists. It's published in the, the BIS Journal, the Bank of International Settlements. Um, so, so there's a lot of work going on about that meta layer that David is talking about by many, many places. But PCI has is going to be funded by the German government, GIZ, to explore this in East Africa. And we are the only think tank, do tank, that has been given um, the okay to try to do this in Puerto Rico, a digital cross-sector regulatory sandbox. So we're right in the heart of all of these issues. And, and, and we approach it with tremendous humility because this is just such a big, different way of looking at the world. Maylin, thanks for sharing that. Um, the uh, The library of papers that have been published by PCI, is, is that on the website for our, mem for our members or for others? Is there ways for them to access some of the great knowledge that's been created by PCI? You're on, you're on mute. Uh, our website is a mess. <laughs> okay. I've, so, I've tried to give the links to it as many times as I can. In the newsletter, um, right after the publication for the German G7, there was a mm -hmm. report on it with links to all of them. I will put here the links to the 11 papers that we did for Germany, the paper that we did for Japan, the current paper that is going to be published in the IEEE journal this month, the, the Bridge Journal, which is a number two print journal. So yes, there is, there is a large body of work. It's just not easily accessible. Well, we look forward to the day that it is more easily accessible, Maylin. But thank you for putting those links in the uh, in the chat today. That's great. If I could, I would just Please, like Jim. to. Yeah, I I mean, this is I probably should have sent this just privately to me, Maylin, but um, I can't resist a little bit of fun here. So. Um, so Maylin, last Tuesday, I was up at Andresen Horowitz, uh, their new office up in San Francisco. And the meeting that I was in where they wanted an AI presentation just happened to be called the Doug Engelbart conference room. So I uh, I grabbed a picture of it and added this to my uh, slide deck. But I just thought you would enjoy that. It was right across from Alan Turing. So uh, he was in good company. And I did walk around and look at the other rooms, and they did have several named after uh, famous women in computing as well, which I, I gave them a thumbs up for uh, that as well. It's really good to know. The augmentation system, I have not seen that for years, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> it's very relevant. Boy, don't I wish, I miss Doug so much. I wish he were, was alive. I uh, miss him every day. Yeah. Yeah, that's and really interesting. Go ahead. Hmm? Oh, I was just going to say, Jim, that's really interesting. I saw the note at the bottom that Vannevar Bush and someone else, uh, I can't recall, funded programs that led to Doug getting funding. That's really amazing to know. Yeah, Lick, Lick Lighter. Yeah. Lick A lighter. lot of people know about Bush and Lick Lighter. But uh, yeah. Yeah, that's and, and Jim, just one of the comments that your presentation that you gave on Thursday um, that you referenced about. Uh, you know, the exa uh, zettabyte error was extremely, I, I highlighted it to a number of people because you oh. fantastic material. So really appreciate that. Great, great. Maybe you're the source then of a couple of people reached out to me, including this uh, Harvey Castro, MD. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, so that, Harvey and that I was connected. Together. Yeah, he's in uh, digital health. Focusing. Oh my gosh, I 
I'm so much. I've just been emailing with him all morning because I'm reading his stuff. It's just really extraordinary what he's doing with AI and healthcare. Really incredible. And if people don't know what we're talking about, I will put this um, in the chat again. I think I put it in once because it was you, um, just really. You guys really are, are are absolutely um, fulfilling the virtue of doing an open mic session, right? is that you know the unconstrained nature of this the number of things that we've shared with each other is remarkable thank you <laughs> well we must say thanks to you kevin for doing this so that we could let yeah, all thank you, this kevin. information come out oh yeah i mean the the uh the, the our our committee we, we we were doing this every once in a while because we didn't have a speaker now we program it on purpose Right, because we know that uh, the uh, nobody's shy in the PCI community, and you know we have these generous conversations, and w there's always something going on, right? That you know somebody can bring to the table, so it's wonderful. Um, Suzanne, you're new to, you. the, to to the organization, to the community, so. Um, do you have a topic that's been on your mind? Um, so we would welcome you um, putting something in uh, that we could discuss if, if something's been on your mind. Well, um, the current thing is that um, is on my mind is how do I develop uh, the nonprofit that I formed? I it does it's pre website. Um, uh, there isn't a solid business plan as of yet. So, uh, and it's really, it's just myself and my son helping me and I have a co-chair, but she's accepting a position with NSA. So I'm not really sure she's going to be able to continue to help me co-found this. Uh, what is the it? What, what, oh. what is the, what is the new entity? Well, the entity is the foundation. I'll put it in the chat. Uh, the foundation for biodefense research. Okay. That, or 501. Uh, C3. And um, so that legal part has been established. And it's, it's, it's the foundation for this would, well, my vision right now is to see it possibly as a reg regional endeavor, um, supporting um, the open, uh, open data, open science, uh, legislation, for uh, the interface between you know, the public and the federal government and the need for uh, maybe less legislation, but governance for biosafety and biosecurity. And most of my research um, to date, uh, there's been um, a collaboration. I recently just joined a board uh, at Kansas State University uh, where we've established a certification for um, for, for AI and uh, AI program for space. And um, since I, so I'm, I'm still in the formation stage and uh, looking at space and, and satellites and as a platform for measuring the standards of technology, biotechnology, and how, what would that look like in the, you know, it, in the soon future where I could support, uh, I, I've spent a great deal of time the past decade supporting the intelligence community okay. um, all, all the way up to NRO. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a caregiver to my mom and my brother. So I really wasn't ready at the time to fully commit full time to an intelligence company, a large one like Booz or anybody. And uh, so I just ran out uh, subchapter S IDIQ Inc. And um, I haven't, I wasn't funded. I just couldn't fully commit until they both passed away. And now I'm in with Paws and Claws. So uh, I thought of the, the nonprofit. I, I looked at, you know, where the trends were going and the issues of trust, public trust, and yet that balance between scientific data that that should be very well protected, um, but you know, with taxpayers' money and this push for open science, which is a very good thing, at the same time it could be used for harm. 
And, uh, and what would that big internet look like if we could prevent the next WMD? So, so we, so we have an idea of your mission. So uh, I just need, I need help. And okay. So I, what do you, what, what do you, yeah. So you need help. Be specific about what should the community be looking for that you need? Um, I think to help form an entity or, you know, this nonprofit or, or the S Corp into an entity that could support countering terrorism um, and yet serve the public. I'm just in the conceptual phase. Okay, so, so I, I, you could talk to me I, offline. I, I, I have consulted with the Office of Director of National Intelligence before, Excellent. so, you know, okay. I, but I would never take their, um, secrecy credentials because I don't want them, right? right. Um, everything that I could offer, I, I could do in the clear. Uh, so if- I prefer that. To, and so I don't want any, you know, dark secret stuff, but in terms mm -hmm. of coordination governments, I sit on a lot of boards. So just let me know. Glad to oh, I, give you some I, advice and counsel. Please, I, I, let's uh, talk about this. Where, okay. where, are you, where are you located? Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I'm okay. about- mile and a half away as the crow flies from the oldest land grant university on the planet uh, in the uh, united states not on the planet i'm sorry the, the united states is way too young to be the oldest anything like that right but um in the u.s right okay, UNC. okay great um well let i'd like to physically meet so i uh, will fly there i go to dc a lot i sit on a council there and okay <laughs> let me know uh, I, ben, your hand is up. Yeah, you have just some uh, advice for Suzanne. Yeah, uh, help. No, but I, I certainly would would like to have us help in, in any way we can on it. But I, I have an itch. I'm curious as to why in the 21st century, mm -hmm. the one of the world's uh, best intelligence communities uh, failed to anticipate or prepare for in Israel for the Palestinian incursion. And uh, I, uh, it's hard for me to fathom that, that there wasn't an ocean of knowledge for pre preparing such an event exactly. uh, of magnitude that I'm just perplexed that uh, the amount of effort it took to uh, assemble or range rockets, paragliders, and everything like that just should have been such a loud preparation. Ben, ben you I'm know, going to offer you a an alternative reality theory, all right? Which is they knew. Yes. They wanted to be attacked and provoked so that they could overwhelmingly do something else, right? Mm -hmm. That they were waiting for an excuse to do something. Now, I, that that's very dark theory, yeah. but if you're playing game theory, um mm -hmm. they say okay well you know we never saw this coming uh, it's a huge huge but, price but what if yeah. you, i know but but what if but what if you did and you just said let it happen i'm just giving well, you I, i'm i'm because those scenarios do play out okay as you say yeah okay just it, like, it's like it mccarthy is. saying bring it on <laughs> Well, yeah, I, personally, I, I it shows you it's always easier to be a Monday morning quarterback, you know, than, than look at all the data and say, OK, this is going to be the future. Right. You know, in hindsight, it's easy to say the video is going to be a trillion dollar company. Right. Why not invest more in it? And uh, so, you know, predicting the future is hard uh, would be my my comment. And, you know, every time there's a big event like this, 9-11 and so forth, uh, you know, Pearl Harbor, you know, they do all these like, why did we miss it? Right. And, uh, you know, so you go through and do the analysis. But uh, I guess I'm not as, you know, I, I understand your, your comments. Right. You, um, but uh, you, you can make the same thing about you know, the uh, January 6th. Right. You know why? Why didn't we stop it? Right? Did the people just let it in? Right? And uh, I, I think we go into the wrong direction. Oh, we yes, think about but that. I, but you know, the the fact is that you know, cause doesn't always equal effect. Right? We found out yeah. afterward that you know, when we got attacked on 9/11, we went and attacked Iraq. 
well, guess what? No connection. <laughs> right. right. He gave no, us an no, excuse. I mean, Just gave us an excuse, right? Yeah, well, though it, I, I read it, a really it, interesting book, um, and I forget what the name of it was, but it was that bin Laden actually wanted to have the United States attack Afghanistan. I mean, it, they knew that by doing something this big, it was going to attack us, right? And the, the, my one comment would be is the, um, Hamas is probably expecting um, Israel to do a massive attack, right? So, you know, my guess is, you know, if, you know, there's both sides, right? But right now I'm thinking Hamas wants this to happen, right? They, they, they want, you know, they're, they perpetrated this and they want something big to happen. So um, I would focus more on Hamas than I would have Israel right now. I expect this, it, is, this is not the Eurasia group, right? So, um, yeah. or, or the, the Atlanta uh, Council. So we're a little bit off what we no, use. No, 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 Kevin, Kevin. Let, let me come back to uh, the issue of sure. of uh, knowledge, awareness, and intelligence Good. versus the guardrails. If you look at AI uh, mm -hmm. activities we're addressing right now, right. Uh, we can say we have expected intent and governance, whether it's the U.S. Capitol or whether it's Israel uh, or uh, other activities, but we're faced with uh, a capability that's a lot different from Hamas as an opportunity to make a decision and, and influence. And what kind of guardrails mm. can we put in place when we're saying these other areas of a super intelligent intelligence group as perceptively uh, uh, ha supposedly had guardrails in. And uh, so I, I relate to the AI uh, incursion and threats and possibilities as we, what mm -hmm. kind of mechanisms mm -hmm. can we put in place? Yeah. Well, uh, well thought out. Um, and, you know, I, I suppose as kind of a, an additional is we put a lot of uh, faith in signals intelligence where human, okay, human intelligence, you know, continues to be important too. And we need to make all the investments if you're going to be in that kind of data gathering world. Well, talking about predicting the future, I posted about um, yesterday was anti-ageism day mm -hmm. and, you know, predicting each of us individual future, right? As we get older um, and most of us looking here, we're all look, at least looking like we're over 50 or most of us here, um, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm talking yourself. to yourself. Okay. What's that? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, by the way, I turned on, uh, on Zoom. They, you can turn on a filter to take away your wrinkles. So okay. like right now, I'm maximum um, smooth out my wrinkles filter. I, I own my wrinkles. Right? <laughs> I have earned every wrinkle I have. So I'm going to turn back on my wrinkles. Uh, so you go into choose video uh, filter and uh, you then go to video. And uh, so I'm going to touch up my appearance. So now I Kevin, turned off my Kevin. Kevin adds them. <laughs> Kevin adds them. So Ben, I, I thought about you because you had your filter of another avatar. And my joke uh, is in VR, everyone's, uh, you know, if you're over 40, you're, you're 20 pounds lighter and you're 20 pounds younger, right? That, that That's what your perfect avatar is. And uh, so anyway, you know, yeah, I like that, Ben. And, uh, you know, so, you know, and in fact, uh, in, in 2018, um, there were a billion six-year-olds on the planet. And, uh, you know, the question is, when will there be a billion 80-year-olds on the planet, right? And and I just don't want to be old. I want to I want to be able to do whatever I want to do whenever I want to do it, right? And uh, the question is, is, you know, how can we live a healthy life? And I, in fact, I'm trying to work with uh, Dr. Castro uh, on how can AI, you know, like today, you know, what five things can I do to live a healthier life? And, uh, you know, and then, you know, and can the AI help me make good health decisions, right? And, uh, you know, you know, that's why we go to doctors and, you know, we work with clinicians, we work with other, you know, physical trainers and so forth, physical therapy. Um, so can AI help, uh, especially because it's so costly to, to work with, you know, trained professionals in that. And a lot of people just don't want to bother anyway. By the way, I just want to remind everyone, we're at that uh, time where we, we've done our hour, all right? 
you want to stay with us? Great. Okay. We're going to do another uh, 25 minutes of overtime. But if you have to go, we, we understand, all right, that we only put the 1130 to 1230 Eastern time uh, note on your calendar. So glad to have you with us. And for those of you who are going to stay with overtime, here we go. So uh, I wanted to say, hey, Lynn, good to see you. Hi, everybody. For, for putting all that good information into the conversation and in chat. Oh. Gratitude. Mark. Sorry, I missed all that. I, I woke up uh, late today. I've been sleeping my 10 hours. I've been calling myself 80 minus two and a half. So <laughs> maybe we maybe we should make 80 the baseline and then say we're all 80 minus something uh, or plus something. And that, that would be another way to look at it and say that's the right age to be. Yeah, I, I used to have a client who was a longevity um, scientist and he would go out and say, you know, we're we're just on the cusp of being able to do the engineering so that people can live for a thousand years. And I said, you need to stop talking about that because I said, well, it doesn't sound credible. I said, just double or triple, just say, you know, you're going to be able to live to being 200 or maybe 300 years old, you know, saying you live for a century. Um, I said, people just can't believe you. Right. Although he was a hundred percent, you know, of the opinion that um, he was, working on solutions that would provide that. I said, yeah, but it's different, right? Uh, talking about it in public versus what you, it, it, that's going to require a proof of concept, right? And it won't be credible until somebody lives for a thousand years. <laughs> so anyway, Mark. It's, it's very yeah. likely that the person, the first person to live to 200 years is alive now. Yeah, it could be. Uh, this uh, it, certainly it happens incrementally, and what it means is a huge change in society because because the you know we're set up where young people support old first old people support young people then young people support old people and uh, the whole a lot of things that we now take for granted as the way things are are in the process of in right in our lifetimes right at this moment of changing dramatically. And and that's and I've said this for a long time. I have a list with 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 uh, uh, anthrop cultural anthropologists of all the attitudes that are changing, like privacy and property and money and uh, lots of different things. And uh, I don't think the people in in uh, a couple of hundred years will will look at things the way we look at things today. Um, and of course, it varies by by income level. Yeah. The the system to support a population that did not reproduce at level, uh, at reproduction level, um, that inventiveness is well underway right now with the support of the Japanese government. All right. Um, they're pulling the automation right out of their factories and putting it into the nursing homes and the, you know, other facilities that will be necessary because, you know, the likelihood that, Japan will follow South Korea in terms of importing labor is low. Uh, but automating, uh, you know, the support systems for the population, uh, that's going to be exportable technology in not too many years from now. Um, so, you know, did, wait did for you it. Did you see the article in the New York Times that had the the population going up to 10, 10 billion and then falling back down to 1 billion. Um, the, the, there's a very interesting article. It was uh, kind of one of these illustrated articles. I recommend everybody look at it yeah. just for the, to know where, where uh, some people are thinking, because that's going to be uh, super profound if that happens. Yeah, I mean, and, and generally, the more advanced, I'm giving you a broad generalization, you're going, you're going to be able to find places that this is true, but the more advanced the um, the society is, the less likely it is that they have an interest in having a lot of children, right? You yes. find that the, um, you know, that the population growth is taking places that are less developed. Right. And therefore, there's an unevenness right in in that distribution. So if you're going to get a population collapse. It's, you know, uh, 
that will also have some uneven you know distribution uh and the article takes, a, takes that into account with bubbles and things like that i recommend you look at it just uh, because okay. after, you're absolutely right this is a, through history every time life becomes easier for people they don't want to, they don't need as many children to do the work and once the children live and don't die they don't have to have as many many so yeah that's a, that's a, a yeah. i've always thought of that as a no we were we were discussing earlier mark and you can listen to the later yeah. uh, we were talking about digital inheritances earlier in this conversation okay. that rather than passing down money that there's a different typology of resource right and currency where it would be the knowledge of the previous generation not the money okay not the that as as a fungible resource so anyway I, that's very interesting i don't know whether you touched on the fact of, of how much of that knowledge is going to be private versus public um, we did yeah good. exactly right and and we talked about how to secure it and how to transmit it and how to you know protect it. Well, anyway, why, um, but but, but, but the, did you talk about why you would want to do one or the other? I think I mean I my my bent is is none of it should be secured, none of it should be private, none of it should be individual and property. That it's going to be this this is the big global shift that we're all having this stuff and we're not going to be able to wall ourselves off anymore. You should the have Borg. Been when Maylin was talking about the work that PCI is doing in terms of, you know, next generation, you know, uh, governance and intellectual property stuff. Uh, you need to have a different conversation with Maylin and, and see whether you can help her. But we've been down that particular conversation. Um, the um, Do you have any um, thing to report in terms of progress with your new EAI initiative. Mark. I I have a couple of things. One one is I have a brand new video, uh, which some I I think I may have sent out, but it's finally getting professional. I'm finally getting some money to make uh, professional professional things. So about what we're doing and about asking for people to uh, uh, interest. I wrote a new article, which I think I sent to everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Ben, for liking it. Um, the um, and and so. Yeah, I'm ready to push forward in this. And I'm going to India for three weeks to talk to a lot of government people. And I just talked to somebody from the Middle East. And the idea of having a different system for bringing up kids based on accomplishment rather than based on learning in advance is something that when people hear, they say, wow, you know, that's interesting. You're a visionary. We should, we should talk more. So I think that that's going to, I hope, I mean, I'm, I'm just with this one little person trying to do it, but the uh, but I hope that that will start catching on as a concept that there's an alternative to going to school for six, 12, 20 years before you start doing anything useful for the world. And that that I think is a different paradigm. And I think it's uh, I think it's time is now. So thank you. Um, we have someone who uh, helpfully put uh your article in chat. Doug, um, put it in there for you. And yeah, I just wanted to highlight that, the coming uh, AI native. And, you know, we're going to go from uh, digital natives to AI natives. And I totally yeah. agree with your, your article. So I really appreciate okay. you highlighting that. Good, good. I haven't, I haven't been looking. Where's chat? Chat, chat. Come chat. Come chat. Yes. And that, you know. You can't, you can't spell naive without AI. <laughs> And you can't spell EAI without AI. That's true. So, so but the, the image is interesting because I, I that I wanted to create something like that. And I I had the image of the of the girl, the, the girl on the left, but I didn't have anything of the girl on the right. And I just used Bing and it, you know, it took me two seconds to get it. So and then I went to another AI to put it into a background that looked nice. And so now suddenly I can do much more than I ever could. Uh, mm -hmm. What I'm looking for is when can I put a script in, either either printed or talked that I that I talk in and get a video beautifully illustrated around it through through AI through no other uh, person's intervention but AI. <clears throat> and I'm I'm looking to do that, and I uh, I hope I can. Hey, ben, Mark, would, Mark. You, would would you take over as the host for a moment? I need yeah. to uh, attend to something. I'll be right. Sure, back. sure. Uh, yeah, in, in fact, Mark, uh, I had 
I had done that. I was asked to by a group to do an eight minute video mm -hmm. on uh, risk management and AI. And I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do a talking head. So I, I let chat, uh, I let GPT-4 write up a script mm -hmm. and it completely wrote up the script. I just literally just took that script and put it into, I think it's Steve AI or Steve.io and um, uh, select the kind of movie you want, the voice uh, animation, how you chunk the scenes. Uh, you just general selection, you can edit anything Perfect. and it complete, completely <laughs> renders it. Perfect. Steve IO, STEV? Yeah, just Steve.ai or Steve.io. Okay. And, um, and there are tonight. others. Um, uh, there are others uh, as well. <clears throat> Runway that's, ML and others. That's our world. Hey, let's live in it. Yeah, and also I, I've been showing some of my faculty and students how to make uh, uh, PowerPoint slides automatically as well mm -hmm. uh, from uh, just because PowerPoint has a, a, a really nice feature on VBA, uh, the Visual Basic uh, VBA code. So you just have your uh, LLM generate VBA code, tell it, I don't want slides and don't give me p positions, uh, fillers on the slides. Just give me the, the, the key points and no verbosity and it'll generate it. Then you just take that, cut it out and then put it into the macro segment in PowerPoint and use designer, which is very nice now and getting smarter to help you create slides two things to that let's talk and second put is that written down anywhere so that you can post it uh, yeah I'm, I'm putting it together i'm probably i'm doing a video and i i've got some materials uh, that i can send you i i can send you on it because Please. i've already i've already shown a, that a number of times to some of the uh, faculty uh, now that does not mean i'm an advocate of powerpoint PowerPoint is made for MBAs to do arguments, not to tell me a story. And I, I as as you're learning at HBS, uh, present uh, probably drove you more into the argument side. Um, although I know you're a storyteller, that that I th I think that will uh, 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 get allows you to do both. Well, we could do a whole session on storytelling and this and and what it what it's going to be. I think storytelling is is something that needs to merge to to morph into something shorter than stories. Uh, metaphors, for example, is probably yeah. the new storytelling. And I'd love to hear a session and do do that. But you know, there's no there's no BS like HBS. <laughs> See, uh, th this is an inside. Mark was not my student at HBS, so his uh, criticism of his experience there had nothing to do with me. Um, in fact, you were there before I was, I think, right? I was there before uh, you did it. Be before I was on the faculty, so it, it, we we made it better, Mark. We made it better. I I, I certainly hope you did, and uh, <laughs> you certainly got nicer digs than when I was yeah. there. Um, but the the there's so many questions of things that are changing. There are so many questions of things that are changing. And, you know, even before all this generative AI, there would, it existed on our phones. You know, they had these memories where it would bring back the scenes of, of a particular period and then and make a beautiful thing with background music and you could specify the amount of time you wanted. And it, it was really very, very good. It still is. And now we're... Being able, just being able to control that more. And so it's, we can add the void. We can say, make the pictures coincide with the voice, make the make the text coincide with it. We can, we can do all that kind of stuff. And my whole perspective is let's learn early. Let's, I mean, and if we, the, and, and if we, the older people are figuring out some of this, then why aren't we immediately working with the younger people to share it with them so that we're cross-fertilizing. And, and that is, we're, we're, our society is not, exist, is not set up to do that. 
It's not set up to cross fertilize old and young, but it should be. Doug, I, I love the pictures you put in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Ben, if I if you play if you have some experience with Steve AI, I'd be interested in seeing the, the tool how you use it. Um, yeah, I, I'm happy to happy to do that. Have a yeah. session and show you. I wouldn't say the product is great. I just I, I I threw the thing together because I was pissed off. I didn't want to do a talking head, and uh, they wanted an eight minute video. And uh, so I did it. I I could even I I, I can set okay. it up to show you. Uh, oh, but, yeah, yeah. Let's 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 connect and. Uh, but uh, we'll yeah, I guess all of us. Do it for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you want to do that, Ben, I'd be happy to. If yeah, if you want to set up a time that works for everyone. Um. Yeah. The the, the one thing I was looking at is we were talking about emotions and. Uh, so I have this concept of uh, where you have, a, you know, emotions tied to a color. And some of us aren't very good at reading facial expressions and emotions. Um, like, you know, so here you have a group of students, right? And can you use AI to, so the teacher, <laughs> can, you know, what, what if, if everyone's gray, you know, if all the students are gray, they're, they're, they're being very bored, right? And how do you, you know, to your image that you had, uh, how do you get everyone, these na AI natives, to be excited and interested in the topic? I, right? I can I can tell you that our global classroom, when I am online with people around the world from my global classroom, I can tell whose camera's on, who's made motions in seconds uh, on their face and other things like that that gives me feedback. So at the end of our session, I can f tell who was attentive and who wasn't. And we demand our students have their cameras on. And we uh, we have one faculty who, if their camera's off for 15 minutes, they they drop them automatically from the class. So if somebody Mark, is, Mark, if somebody's Mark not paying it. attention, if somebody's not paying attention, is that their fault or your fault? Yeah, well, that's, that's that, my that's point. The, that's, the real, that's the real question. Doug, I was gonna point you to something, if I can find it. There was a, 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 a guy who survived a pilot of a 747 or an A380 who survived a huge disaster in the sky and then gave some talks about how they did it. And what he had done is he said, listen, we take all our emotions and I put them into two categories, red emotions and blue emotions. And the only way we survived is that I just got rid of the red, I just dropped the red ones and I stayed with the blue ones, you know, blue ones to figure things out, do what it is, keep calm, what can we do? And he said that, that really, that got us back to the ground. Um, it's a, it's a great, he's a great guy. It's a great story. Are there uh, other things folks want, want to address? We've got just a few minutes. The last and most important question is, and comment. I want to know what Suzanne is thinking because she's very, you're very expressive, Suzanne, <laughs> in your face, in your facial part. So what oh, is yeah. going on? No, I'm. I just. Uh, I, I'm very passionate about all of the things you, everyone here, is talking about. You're just. I don't know. I'm really connected. And and the reason why Let's I look at that, first on one on one sometimes, Suzanne. No, I, I, I mean the reason why I'm preoccupied. It takes me a long time to write down all of these these uh, links. So um, I'm dominant so, left hand. It doesn't work. So save I, chat. You know how to save the chat. Okay, can yeah. you teach me how to save chat? Uh, yes. It's right at the bottom, the ellipse at the bottom of the, the dots, chat the screen. Ellipses. Yeah, go to the chat screen. Yeah. And at the bottom, there's an ellipse down there. Like a uh, the plus sign? Three dots. No, the Three dot, dots. dot, dot. That's called an ellipsis. Okay, wait. Oh, the ellipsis. dot. Got it. I got, wait a second. Uh, okay. And then, and then what do I do? Say, just hit save chat and click it just on says, save. Wait, it says reply, copy, or quote. No, no, you're on, you're on the, you're not at the bottom of the page, the bottom of the chat. At the okay. true bottom of the chat. Oh, the true. There, um, so open the chat window. I am. And, I'm in. I'm in okay, the chat. At the, at the bottom, there's about five five symbols, and one of them is the ellipsis, as <laughs> Mark I'm, says. Three dots. If you no, mouse okay. over, if you mouse over that, it should show save chat, and then move your mouse down and save chat. Like right here. You could. Yeah. Yeah. You see, see it right there. 
no, okay, see, I'm on this path, this, right? And it says send to everyone, right? It's at the bottom. And this says tap here to chat or tap. No, no, but down below it. Do you see these, this below oh, that smiley yeah. face and everything? No. Right, the, the oh, I see a smiley face. And yeah, the, I see right, right, right next, next to the to smiley the face. Dots. Right next <laughs> to it. To okay, the right. This, yeah, I know. It says right more. It, the one that says more. If you it mouse does, over yeah. it, it says more. I, I'm not mouse. I don't have a mouse on. Um, oh. <laughs> no, yeah, I have my like fingers. It. Track you, gotta, you, you have the smiley face and then these three dots right here. Guess what? The three dots are missing. Oh, really? Yep. It's just smiley face and then an arrow. Like to uh, That's after a comment. That's a comment. Uh, you got to go lower yeah. all the way to the bottom. I am, you yeah. guys. I, why don't you climb in here? Okay. Really? I'll stop sharing. Yeah. No, you're great. Can you climb in? Or can uh, Casey? Can, can you, can you share? Well, yeah, yeah. Why don't you share your screen and we can share share your screen. Oh God. Yes, yes, <laughs> no, no, look. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna I look, get you right guys here. Guys. See right here? See that? Where, where are you? Uh you, you gotta share your screen that has your uh okay. No, it's right here. This is chat. It doesn't chat come up. No, no you're, you're not you're showing sure. your never mind. Your people, your internet is never mind. You're showing it's your, your graphic. You uh, anyway, otherwise we will send it to you. Thank you. Well. Uh, that's okay. I, the I other can, thing you can do is we can, we can include the chat with the link to the recording of the yeah. meeting. Yeah, please do. Yeah, thank you, Casey. <laughs> that um, was entertaining. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs> the the, the Casey, other you. thing you Casey. can do is is you can right click, scroll up, it highlights everything, and then you can right click, yeah. copy. It, Okay, it says it, it does say view full transcript up on the right, you know, chat, apps, yeah. view full transcript, high captions, meeting settings, blah, blah, blah. raise hand. Okay, then, that's that that's the transcript. That's not the chat. But go ahead. Okay. I, I just had um yeah, ever ever since uh I was a reviewer for a panel on NSF, my computers didn't really do it. One more so thing. So with that, one more way, one more thing. <laughs> Gavel out. Kevin? There's yes. a there's a there's a feature now in in Zoom which is summary. Um, uh, are we using that? I it's, am not using that. There's an AI summary and a lot of people yeah are very good and okay. so it will just summarize in text everything that we said. Yeah, I'm aware just, that the that the it was offered I think the middle of this last week. Yeah. I just haven't installed it yet, but I'm aware that it, it exists and it's try it. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I just need to, it's free. I just need to install it. Hey. Everyone, thank okay. you for a great call. Uh, we look forward to uh, talking to you. I think it's going to be three weeks before we're together next based on our schedule, but we look forward to it. And let me just remind you, we do look forward to your um, contributions to the uh, 50th anniversary of the internet. Uh, and we had the um, thoughts that, preceding events that seeded ARPANET, which was you know the beginning of the internet, and things that you envision uh, for 50 to 100 years from now, we welcome those thoughts because we'll put that in a different kind of prognostication view uh, for someone to open. With that said, thanks a lot, and everything you do, be intentional. Cheers. Thanks Bye. for your patience, buddy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.